Hi, this is Jordan Selleck, CEO and co-founder of 51 Labs. And in today's event, we sit down with the legends of business development and private equity. Bob Landis, Gretchen Perkins, Glenn Oaken, Jay Jester, Ted Kramer, Mark Jones. We're gonna be covering a lot, specifically the history of business development, how it has evolved over the years. We're gonna talk compensation, how you can earn a seat at the table, and the future of business development and private equity. First, a little bit about 51 Labs. We're a marketing firm focused on the middle market and VC communities. We do LinkedIn content that gets you five and 10,000 views per week for free on LinkedIn, and that leads to deals. We do portfolio company videos. We do firm videos. We do virtual AGM production. We do event production and a whole bunch of digital marketing services. Please reach out if we can help out. Thanks. I'd like to uh, introduce Dan Lee. Dan, would you mind showing your video? What's up, Jordan? Awesome. Good to see you. So uh, Dan and I have known each other for four years, have uh, talked about, you know, the first company I started with Debt Maven, been incredibly helpful with that. Also with uh, working with veterans together for the past four years. And uh, you might have seen his content on LinkedIn recently. We helped do the, the videos for him. Uh, so Dan, can you go, kind of give a high level of your background? Sure. Yeah. So it's great to be here, Jordan. The panel you pulled together is bananas. I mean, really, I've got my notepad here. And so I think it's going to be awesome. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, Dan Lee with Convest Partners. Uh, we're a private equity firm based in West Palm Beach. Um, I'm on the lending side of our business. Most relevantly for this discussion, I've been a lender for 20 years, um, moved from risk to business development, had then transitioned into a combination of kind of utility player and management before finding out being told that I'm bad at management. And so um, kind of in my mind, demoted back to BD from, you know, from being a, a decision maker and it took me a few years to figure that out. I'm now luck luckily I've got an incredible team, incredible sports system, and I've been able to kind of find my way to, to enjoying and relishing BD and finding that, um, you know, this is the, this to me, this is the fun part of the job is figuring out how to make things happen with incredible people. And so I mean it when I say I'm really excited to hear from everyone today and, and just super grateful that, that they would take the time. That's awesome. Cool. So let's uh, now go to the next stage and introduce our panelists. First, Bob Landis who is a founding partner of the origination team at the Riverside Company. Next, Gretchen Perkins, who is a partner at Avance Investment Management, which recently launched and is gonna be excited to get into her story. Ted Kramer, who is president and CEO of HKW, which is one of a, uh, our clients at 51 Labs. Glenn Oaken, who is a managing director of Mangrove Equity Partners. Jay Jester, partner at Plexus Capital and Mark Jones, partner at River Associates. All righty, so my first question, actually to help kind of frame this discussion, I wanna kind of break it up into three macro pieces. One is the beginning of business development, the early days of getting this started. The next is the evolution of business development. We're gonna get into internal attitudes about it, compensation, reporting, the teams, uh, and the last big piece of this is the future of business development. So I'd like to start off with Bob and Jay to kind of talk about what was your journey getting into business development and what were some of the challenges that you faced in creating this function? Yeah, Bob Landis here from the Riverside Company. Uh, I spent 24 years in the bulge bracket investment banking working with major companies, Pfizer, Agco, John Deere, IBM, Pepsi, and then I spent the last 10 years in the aerospace and defense, working with L'Oreal, McDonnell Douglas, uh, Boeing, um, Lockheed, Lytton, Newport News, the, uh, the, ent the entire gamut of the aerospace and defense. So when I transitioned from working with companies that had billions of dollars to working with a PE firm that had 15 portfolio companies, and I was the 23rd hire, and we were around for 32 years, and I joined uh, 19 years ago. It was a transition that was brand new to me. I had no idea what PE was. I had no idea what the industry was all about, because most people didn't know what the industry was about. Um, we were a small uh, investment asset class that nobody talked about, 
And we really didn't move the needle much. People had heard of KKR and some of the others, but for us at the lower end of the middle market, all brand new. The one thing I knew was that I knew what I didn't know. And I didn't know the industry, but I knew how to market. I knew how to sell my company, my firm, and what we had to offer. And I also knew that we didn't have a very good CRM system. And that's the first thing that I implemented. Jay, what about you? Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd go back to, um, you know, my first job out of college, and I was an English major at the University of North Carolina. Um, and I somehow was able to BS my, myself into an investment banking job with a firm called Bulls Hollowell Connor, um, which was one of the first uh, non Wall Street M&A boutiques, um, you know, focused on this emerging middle market. I, I think we're in the I think we're just now beginning the fifth modern wave of private equity. So this is to frame it was at the beginning of wave two, you know, after a, a pretty meaningful Gulf War downturn, I was working at this small M&A shop in Charlotte and had the chance to work for Erskine Bowles and, uh, and got assigned to a project with him. We were trying to figure out how to generate uh, business uh, from this rapidly growing pool of, uh, you know, private equity firms that were out there. So that was sort of the first introduction. When that uh, two-year program ended, uh, and the, probably what uh, changed the path of, I'd say, the trajectory of my career, my life was I got a chance to go to Tampa and um, and meet Glenn Oaken. Um, so you, you really should be asking Glenn this question, but uh, Glenn hired me as his wingman at Florida Capital Partners, um, which at the time was, you know, we were probably what uh, 40, 50 million bucks from Chemical Venture Partners focused on small deals. If, the, if a day passes that I don't find myself trying to ask myself, what would Glenn Oaken do uh, in terms of building relationships and trying to be the best at sourcing small deals, as opposed to, I think a lot of people came into business development of, oh, that's my foot in the door. You know, I don't have a traditional finance background, so I can do business development until I can convince this firm uh, that I can, you know, they should trust me on the deal side. Uh, I think what Glenn taught me and really made me proud of was go be the best at this. It's a really important skill set. That was a groundbreaking idea in 1990, 1992. Um, I think more people are trying to do that now. And everybody you see on this call is, has realized the value of trying to be the best at finding deals because uh, last time I checked, it's really hard to tell the difference between $1 and another dollar and the differentiation that you can provide in this seat and the leverage that you can get in this seat is, uh, is awesome. So thanks, Glenn. Thank you. And Glenn, so that opens the door. I think um, one, one of your other panelists accused you of being one of the OGs in, in business development um, in private equity generally. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that, how you watched yourself evolve and, and the, the position, the field sure. evolve over the years. Well, I'll start by saying quite sincerely that the, the students are past the teacher and, and Jay. Um, you know, I, I think that when I started in private equity and FCP started in, in, in private equity in 1989, some of the greater challenges had to do with the fact that the industry and we were in our infancy. Uh, we really had to try things out and figure things out. Um, Bob mentioned building a CRM. This was pre-internet. And uh, so it, it was very interesting trying things and you know, shooting some, some BBs before, you know, big ordinance. Uh, and we, the types of things that we did, for example, was we, we literally subscribed to every paper version city business journal and scoured them and, and, uh, and put that into our little spreadsheets and then had to go see these people in person there were conferences, I think ACG started in 1954, uh, but I don't think that the organizations like ACG, IBBA, AM and AA had matured yet. Um, so there was just a, a great deal of effort to find information where we could, organize it as best we could and then get out there. Um, we did very early on organize ourselves along functional lines and did have dedicated resources and focus on BD we did look at our universe of potential deal sources as customers and treated them with respect, which was not universal, I think, in the industry at the time. Uh, and this built from there. And Ted, talk about as, as a founder and CEO, um, love your perspective on how you viewed 
the BD function as you, as you built the platform. Unlike most of the firms here, HKW was founded a long, long time ago in 1903. What we do today is significantly different back then, but you know, to frame it into sourcing, when I joined HKW in 2001, uh, I uh, was actually hired to do transactional related work. I think if I said that loudly in the halls here in our office, everyone would laugh. Uh, and uh, we started the sourcing. When we got out of the pledge fund environment, and into a, a formal fund structure. And, you know, we were coming up a hundred year old anniversary, founded in New York, had some good success doing one-off deals. Um, and yet we didn't have really any deal flow. So Jim Snyder, another partner, I flew to Cleveland on a cold February, uh, National City Bank was an LP at that time. And, uh, you know, my light bulb turned on as I'm phone calling uh, for meetings. Uh, we get meetings, uh, we sit in, we hand out our business card, and we got, what are you guys, a law firm? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. I heard of you guys before. Um, and, and after a day and a half of those trips, I think Jim and I came back with about 10 offering memorandums of opportunities that we would never have seen had we not just physically showed up and reminded people of who we were. And I think all of us worry and lose sleep uh, about how to stay top of mind in this overly uh, competitive quasi low barrier to entry business that, that Jay referenced a couple of minutes ago. Uh, we, we did something similar in New York the next month with the same result. And then I was crawling out of my seat to have the partner support me at that time as, an, as a VP to go out and, and, and put a program together. Um, and, I, and I think all of us, uh, when we finally connected at IBBA conferences and everything else, we joined at the hip pretty quickly and realized that we all were going through the same stresses and pressures uh, within our own organizations, but also knew that we could help each other. So we've always been friendly competitors. And I think it, it was not a challenge, but something that we could lean on each other for and still be respectful of trying to compete fairly and, and find deals uh, for, for, for your respective firms. We've had a multitude of dinners uh, over the years uh, and have helped each other out as well. Excellent. And Mark, I'd love to hear both from an individual standpoint and institutional standpoint, how you've looked at building BD at River. I joined River in uh, 1995. We were founded in uh, 1989 as well, like Florida Capital. And when I joined, I guess the, the, the biggest issue was kind of internal friction about a dedicated BD function. Um, our founding partner prided himself on not having, uh, not having the River Associates phone number in the phone book, remember when we had those, so that he wouldn't get, um, he wouldn't get solicitations from people asking for money. And I'll never forget the first time I wanted to go to ACG Intergrowth. Um, I guess it was the late 90s. Um, I, turned in the, I turned in the expense request and he made me cancel Intergrowth. <laughs> he said it was too expensive. Um, so it's changed a lot from there, obviously. We, we subscribe to the old school um, form of PE management, I'll call it. And everybody did a little business development, but not much. Everybody was involved in deals. Everybody sat on boards and so Obviously, when you get tied into a deal, the easiest thing to do is to cancel that marketing trip to Denver or Cleveland or Milwaukee. And honestly, that's the last thing you need to do. And so um, we've come a long way since then, I'm sure as all these firms have. Um, but ultimately, you're still you're, you're communicating a message. It's just a different message. The message used to be, hey, we're a private equity group. Show us your deals. And now... Now we're all trying to communicate a point of differentiation because processes are more competitive, especially in COVID days, processes are tighter. They don't need another one of us at the table, but they do like to have another one of us that's differentiated in some way. And so I think that's the, that's the challenge for us, for anybody on this call, for anybody, anybody listening, that's the challenge is to differentiate yourself from the, I don't even know, 3,000 private equity groups, not to mention independent sponsors and family offices out there. That's awesome. Can, can we talk a little bit about, before we go to the next section on the evolution of it, can we identify what are some of the underlying principles that you think led to your success in starting the function 
for example, I think Ted, one of the things I got from your point was finding the tribe and you could be, you know, overlapping or in the same ministry, but find your tribe if people are in the same, you know, doing the same thing. So you have that support network. But I'd like to kind of, before we go to the next section, maybe go around the table and just kind of hear, what do you think are some of the underlying principles the BD professionals here can take home if they're starting a function, if they're trying to level up their function or just kind of navigate their career? Yeah, Jordan, so let's let's start that with Gretchen because I think that's where I was about to go. I think this is, this is a great starting point, right? She's going from 10 years of building out a very productive, institutionalized, highly effective BD effort to now stepping to a different path right, and, and starting something different. So that I think that's a great segue to sort of what, you, what you've learned and what you take with you. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, Jordan. And first of all, hello to all my friends on this top ribbon. It's, it's so great to see you guys. It's been obviously way too long. And I'd just like to also call out and congratulate Jay for having inserted North Carolina in the first 14 seconds of his commentary. Well done, Jay. That's a pro tip that the rest of us can uh, appreciate. And Ted, of course, posing in front of a hockey player picture. I don't know who that could be. You guys are, you guys are good. Um, <laughs> and wearing safety glasses, apparently. Still living, still living, still living the dream. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I would like to comment on just a bit of the evolution of the role, Dan, and then I'll jump into, you know, what my new situation is and what I can bring to it in terms of lessons learned. But frankly, um, so I joined, I was fortunate enough, fortunate enough to join this, this um, function, this PEBD function after all of you had already done it. So it was easy to find the tribe as you state, Jordan, I love that phrase, um, to find the tribe and just look at the folks that are doing it well and be like them. And um, that's, that's, I was coming in from a lending background. I, you know, I had been 13, 14 years in commercial lending, doing sourcing and origination. So just kind of pivoting to a new asset class. And, um, and it was easy, it was easy. And everyone in our function group then and now for everybody who's on the phone is very collaborative, uh, definitely friendly competitors. And over the years I have gotten too many to count um, introductions to opportunities from other private equity professionals. So um, that's, that's a wonderful thing about where we're at. Um, some of the principles, Dan, that I'll be bringing to, um, to Avance, my new firm from my almost 20 years in doing this thus far, is it's boots on the ground has always been a core principle. Um, now boots on the ground looks different in COVID days. And we'll look a little bit different going forward, though we will get back to real boots on the ground. But you know, you have to consider 20 years ago, um, folks, investment bankers, um, there weren't independent sponsors really as a crew, other <coughs> referral sources, even accounting firms, law firms, lenders, they didn't have great CRMs, right? So the being in front of someone's office, you know, to what Ted um, described, but they would have never, you know. They would have never seen those deals had they not shown up in those offices because people didn't have an ability to Google or go to some you know great CRM and and look up target buyers. So um, boots on the ground was required given where we were at in a technology world. As the industry has matured, boots on the ground are still important because we need to as things get more competitive. We need to really build good relationships with those deal sources, no matter what kind of deal source it is. If it's a proprietary you know, deal that came through an accounting firm or through a deal from an investment bank where there's many, many potential buyers. You need to, you still need to show up and form a personal relationship with these deal sources if you hope to get yourself angled into a process that, you know, as Mark said, they don't really need another. Um, you need, we need to give them a reason for wanting to have another in and whether it's the expertise that we bring, um, others will claim the same expertise and the personal relationship of people knowing you as a person for being responsive, candid, you know, a straight shooter, um, you know, smart, uh, will be a good 
partner for their client. All of those things are, are the soft side and very, very important in um, now, you know, 20 years later, participating in very, very competitive processes. Can we talk a little bit about what, I don't know how to phrase this delicately, I'll just say it bluntly. What does bad BD look like? You know, all of you have been here for 10, 20 years. <laughs> I'm going to throw that one in there. That's a whole separate. I know, right. getting, I know we're let's, getting a lot of let's, questions. Let's, too, but let's but. kind of talk about like, what does, what do, and maybe, maybe you, you, you no, made got, these, maybe got a couple. these early mistakes. Like how have you evolved and, and how yeah. you, you, bad BD is when you don't say no fast enough. And that is something that is only learned through time because you're deal hungry. You want to show your colleagues, you're able to bring deals in. You want to show them that you're not just a, a BD person. You can assess a deal. You can look at financials. You can identify trends. You can, you know, intelligently discuss pros and cons and why we do or do not have an angle here and why we should go hard or not, but we should just kill it. And sometimes that early in my career that led to way too many questions to the deal source, way too many, just, you know, way too many things that are not going to move the needle on kind of the go, no go decision. So I believe over t a bad BD is when you prolong the no, that's, that's bad BD. <laughs> More bad BD is not knowing how to read financials. And I am, there's a shocking number of people in our positions, um, in you know more junior that you know didn't don't don't know how to read a financial statement so I don't know how you have an intelligent conversation with a deal source about that those are the two big things that I say um, demonstrate I would, add, I would add I would just add quickly uh, bad BD is when some of our peers say they see all deals and don't need to travel as much uh, that's, <laughs> the, that's the easiest that's the easiest way to compete against somebody is not knowing their audience and uh, having that kind of an attitude. And we see it a lot. Uh, we all chuckle, but um, go ahead, Mark. I was just going to say that I think it's critical for somebody to be able to speak for the firm. Know, know, if, it's, know if it's a deal you're going to do. Don't be a book collector. Don't be an empty suit. Um, hopefully, firms are not compensating people in the number of SIMs taken because that's kind of a silly thing to do. Um, but know what deal you're gonna do. Don't waste an investment banker's time. If it's not a fit, tell them quickly. And Mark, that, that goes to hiring the right individuals uh, with the right EQ and IQ or technical capabilities, and then giving those people the authority, hopefully that they deserve, um, because that you know pushing a rope thing for an intermediary is, is, is hell. And we can tell what bad BD looks like by what the intermediaries tell us. They thank you profusely for doing what we think is, is de rigueur. And of course, you're going to extend that courtesy and, and have the detail and the systems to give that kind of response. But the intermediaries tell you by, by uh, thanking you for doing it well. You know, Gretchen, Gretchen said, Gretchen, yeah, Gretchen you, you said not reading a financial. I'd say bad BD is not being able to read the person across the table. If you haven't done research before you walk in, know something about that person. I know LinkedIn didn't, didn't exist back then, but every time I was on a call, I would put a little note in there, child, brother, sister, baseball, college, anything I had. And the next time I talked to them, I would bring that up. And then listening to read the reaction of the person. When you're talking to them and you can see them glazing off, don't go into your spiel about how great your company is. Get back to the get back to the subject of what you are doing to create value for your firm, which means he can sell you that company. And, and the other thing is never, never ask, what do you have for me? I, have, I, I don't even ask that. It will come up in conversation, but that's the biggest turnoff. Every bad BD person says, so what have you got for me? Well, who are you? You remember that old advertisement? I don't know you. I don't know your company. I don't know why you're here. Now, what is it you want to sell me for or sell to me? I mean, you've got to develop that rapport. And I think Gretchen, you nailed it. And so did Mark. You've got to, you've got to develop that rapport with the person somewhere down the line. You don't have that much time to do it. So you've got to do all your research ahead of time. What's in it for them? That's it. What is in it for them? If you buy a lot of buy a lot of companies, you know I could have one eye in the middle of my forehead and not bathe for a month. They will talk to me because I am money in their pocket. And you've got to create that value proposition for the person on the other side of the table. 
why should I bring your company into it? How fast can you respond? And, and I think, you know, Dan, when you're talking about how quickly can you get back? A fast no, absolutely. Get well, back fact, to them. It seems like one of the interesting things we've seen in this latest evolution or next stage is considering the reciprocal nature of the relationship and that, you know, the private equity side has to be equally in the service mentality of the other parts of the community. And I was wondering, do any of you have a template form on feedback that you give bankers, you know, reason declined, X, Y, Z bullet points. Do you see that as a best <clears throat> practice or am I just kind of throwing stuff out there that's been tried and hasn't, hasn't worked? You, you need that. Basically you have to codify, you know, or record your reasons for rejecting everything and, and a sufficient data in your CRM in part to give that feedback, but more importantly, to go back and slice and dice your data to find out what you're seeing, what you aren't seeing. Um, just the trends. You have to make data-driven decisions and capturing that information is essential. Right. Well, I would, what I would add, just so I think in summary to what everyone's saying is, and, and we're sticklers about it here at HKW is, you know, you're, you're trying to, we're, 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 we're all essentially in the no business, right? You collect 10 books, you're gonna say no to 10 or nine or whatever the math is. But we never wanna not see their next opportunity. That is the best sourcing individuals in the industry, especially in the smaller and the middle market, manage those intermediary relationships and investment banking relationships. So not to be disincluded on their next, you know, their next, um, you know, their next potential partnership for you. Um, and I think that's, that's pivotal. We're all in the benefit of the doubt game, you know, all things else equal. Mark Jones has beaten, River's beaten HKW out of deals. We beat them out of deals. Same with many of us on the phone. Listening to you all is just taking the longer view. And how many years have you known each other? And then you have this type of collegiality and it's just taking the long view of a career and the long view of the firm's reputation. Um, but Jay, I'd love to hear your thoughts before we go to the next topic. Like what is, what does bad BD look like? And then I'd love to go into the, the evolution of BD talking about like comp, attitudes, et cetera. You know, you, you'd, you'd ask a question about sort of key principles, and I think it ties in to what we were just talking about. Uh, and I'd say there, there are two. One is, I'd, and, and one leads into the other. Um, there was a uh, young adult book. I used to read all my kids' books from uh, that they had to read in uh, middle school and high school. And there was one called Walk Two Moons. And, that, and it's the old expression that you have to, before you can understand somebody, you have to walk two moons in their moccasins. Um, and then to your long-term point, I think that leads, if you do that right, uh, to one, I think one of the guiding principles of good BD is, uh, is, is creating a culture of what I call long-term fair. Um, and I think the flip side is true. You know, I think some of the worst BD that you'll see is the short-term transactional mindset. And I would see it all the time where a deal partner leads a deal and says, hey, let's hire XYZ bank to sell this company or let them pitch this company because next week I'm going to visit this other company that I wanna buy. And that short-term transactional mindset of I'll trade you a pitch for a win is a horrible idea. And, and I think as you can separate that and as a BD person, first you have to understand the world of the investment banker or the intermediary you know, and when I was at Audax, you, you know, we would close uh, 10 to 20 platforms a year and 100 add-ons. A deal was the deal of the week, if not the deal of the day. For, from our point of view, the guy on the other side of the table, that might be the only deal he's trying to close in 2020. And that's a huge mismatch. If you pass on that on the one or two or three deals of the year, in a disrespectful, um, not long-term way, not only do you do you really hurt that guy's year, you destroy a relationship. Yeah. Um, and and, and so once you understand you. those economics and and you can take the long-term fair, and I think a big part of a good a good BD person is also being the historian of your firm, and to be able to say, uh, you know, in 1994 you showed us a deal and, and you gave me the chance to put my best foot forward and we won that deal and it was a great deal. And that was a long ass time ago. And I still remember 
that to me is a big part of the role of really good VP uh, of BD is, um, is being that institutional memory for your transactionally oriented partners. Let's dive into, you know, straight into the, the elephant in the room, which is compensation, how it's evolved and <clears throat> how people on the phone can think about understanding their value because you all have been through your careers in BD and are at the top of it. How should they think about themselves? How should they think about salary, bonus, carry, or not? How should firms think about this? And let's have, uh, let's see, uh, Bob, would you mind kicking off? Yeah, I, I guess when you're looking at salary, how important is BD to the organization? And I know this is a question that everybody asked me when I joined because I was giving carry at the very beginning. Our philosophy has always been the third person that was tired was a BD person. Now that person only worked part time, but BD has always been the lifeblood of the organization. So they were treated as part of the profit center, not a cost center. And that's a big distinction. So when you're working in a BD function at some other firm, how do they regard you? And how do you flip it over from a cost center to a profit center? You have to convince internally, not externally to the outside world, to internally to your management, that BD is going to allow the other partners and the other investment professionals time to work on deals, not to see, seek deals. Because if you're chasing a deal, you can't do a deal. And if you're doing a deal, you can't chase the deal. And if you don't respond to the investment bankers, they disappear. So the value proposition, you have to continue to sell that internally. Sometimes they're not going to start out getting carry, but that's your ultimate goal because that is the recognition that you're valuable. Now there is carry and then there's carry. Partners are going to take a lion's share of that. But if you're not getting recognized and, in, and comped to stay with the firm and it's only salary and bonus, that's, I think, is a mismatch, and it's a recipe for you're getting your training there, and you're going to go someplace else. You want to keep people, and you do it by carry. If you think about what a really good BD professional is good at, and you think about the other functions where they can add material value to a fund, I think they would include fundraising. Uh, if you think about what skill set is needed, <clears throat> what disposition and uh, what skills are, are needed, uh, I think that is a, another way to, to add value to a fund that is hard to refute. You know, it's kind of where the rubber meets the road. You've got to have the capital and you have to have the deals as well. Um, I think it, especially in the lower middle market where the job is huge. I mean, the universe of potential intermediaries, the universe of potential targets is so immense. The job is never done. And you want that luxury of choice. I, I think it's easy to, to argue one's value. I think gathering data and presenting the data in a powerful way is certainly helpful for people um, to be recognized. Um, raising the capital certainly can help as well. In, in oh, our case, we do something unusual. Probably we, we um, grant phantom equity to our entire team. Uh, we have plenty of metrics. We kind of you know, top grade and, and we measure and, and we reward individually, but we try to eliminate some of the politics um, by um, emphasizing and, and rewarding in a way that when the team does well, an individual does well. Is there anybody on this, in this group that's not involved in fundraising? I, I thought so. Everybody, uh, it's, it's so important. If, if you're, when I started out, we weren't invited and pretty, and then we started about the first year, they, they invite us in, in the, well, it was, us, it was me the first year. And they kept asking, well, what do you do? These are the LPs. Why are you important? The market has so changed that if you go in there now and you don't have somebody in BD that's helping out, the LPs are now asking the partners, why don't you have somebody in business development? Why aren't they out there finding deals? How can you exist? So that it's changed. And every one of us is involved in that, I'm certain. That, that's a I'd good like part of the whole, right? I just wanted to amplify what Bob was saying in terms of the LPs from a different direction and addressing your question of how do BD professionals sell their value internally. Um, it is very difficult. You know, I've heard firms that don't have a BD function and I say, wow, how, how is that possible that you have a billion dollar fund or whatever uh, hire and you don't have any specific BD and the, you know, the partner's response is, well, you know, I know all the bankers, right? And, and that's great. And you may hire a BD person and, and you may know all the same people, 
but it's very difficult without a dedicated biz dev function for a firm to, in, to deploy funds in a cadence that is fast enough for what our LPs want. They want us to be fully invested in three to four years. Keep it, let's, let's keep deploy, deploy, deploy. So I would say to those who don't have that function, of course, Bob, the LPs are asking that question that you said, why don't you? Because they can see that the funds that have dedicated biz dev deploy funds faster. It's a bandwidth issue. If you're sunk in a deal for three to four months, then you surface and try to find a new deal. Well, especially in today's environment, you got to lean in on things before they even come to market. So, Mark, um, Mark what do you think about that? Um, I think what we're all saying here, and I totally agree, I'm very involved in the LP relations and fundraising. I think what we're saying is for all of our firms who started the BD function early on, it's evolved. And it's not just finding deals, it's really the outward. It's the consumer facing side of the firm. It's the outward, it's the outward face that everybody sees. And it's not only it's not only relationships with investment bankers, it's not only fundraising, but we've kind of evolved that as well to include um, management meetings with potential acquisitions. And um, so I go to most every management meeting and um, really enjoy it because at the end of the day, it's the same skill set. You're you're I mean, you're in a competition, you're trying to differentiate yourself, you're trying to say why we're better than XYZ fund, the other six or eight funds that you meet with. And so it's really, a, it's really another leg of the stool, interacting with management teams, entrepreneurs, and CEOs. And Ted mentioned that you, in this hyper-competitive period, you absolutely have to differentiate yourself. And who are the people that are going to be best equipped to recognize what the competition is doing? Um, maybe look um, more open-mindedly about the organization itself, your own organization, and say, these are our strengths, these are our weaknesses, and have the court sense to understand basic marketing. Um, what should we be emphasizing and, and lifting up as our differentiators? It's probably not to folks in execution. It's probably the people that are out there in the field and in relationship with uh, friendly competitors and getting the feedback from intermediaries. It's also in identifying resources that are helpful, whether it's leveraging the relationships that I have with the people on this call, or the people watching. Um, we had a, we got invited this morning to a management meeting for a company. And I, I thought, you know, I happen to know an investment banker that does a lot of deals in a related space. I bet he could find some great resources, maybe a potential board member, maybe somebody to take the management meeting. So they're gonna look to me, they're gonna look to everybody on this call to be able to, to be able to find that, you know, be that Swiss army knife and find those resources. I was going to say, if we'd done this call 15 years ago, there would have been about three people on the call, right? And so it does represent the evolution of the industry. It's moved from, I, I like to say 15 years ago, BD was a little bit of the equivalent of ESG today. It's like the partners and investment professionals of the firm kind of cringe when they hear it and think, oh God, we got to, we need a BD guy. Okay. Well, just pay someone a million bucks and, you know, we'll have, tell them to bring books in. And so it really has evolved massively. And, and Bob, I think your comment's really important, largely because LPs have realized how critical it is that you not just have a BD function that's collecting books, but it's an authentic advantage in a process. It's a, you know, knowing how to, how to read the other person, knowing how to use the historical relationship with that banker to say, you know, this, this matters to us, that mattered to us, you saw how we reacted. But I would like to just shift gears a little bit. I think there's one interesting, um, BD is also a lot of fun when things are going up and more money's being raised and um, more deals are getting done. As someone that lost his job in the financial crisis, I can say it's not as fun when we go through tough times. Um, so I'd just be curious um, from people's perspective. I mean, the next few years look pretty bright for BD just in terms of dry powder. You know, I think there's a lot, a lot of wind behind our sales. But you know, how do you think about a down being in a downturn in BD? What what are the tough decisions you have to make, and and how do you improve the function as you go through a tough time? I can tell you this: in 2009, we didn't stop marketing. We kept, we kept at it. And I know Ted and I had this conversation. I think it was in Vegas at ACG Intergrowth in 2009. And, um, you know, I think you told me your philosophy was show up. And we did. And it's, and it served us well. And ultimately, some of those acquisitions that we made in 2009, 2010, they turned into very high returning investments. One of my favorite things about this downturn and this, the uniqueness of this downturn and I'm speaking as an old guy, normally what would happen is there's a lot of young, hungry 
um, business development people coming up who are going to go to conferences, stay out late, build relationships, you know, with the next generation of the investment bankers and the deal sources that are coming along. And in the COVID world, as I look at the, uh, um, you know, people I've known for 20 and 30 years on the call, uh, what I believe is my advantage is I have a massive network and the ability to get those people on the phone, not just because I've not because I've done something for them, but because we're friends. <laughs> and I think the value of a broad network that has been methodically tracked and nurtured and built over decades has gone up because of COVID. Um, it is it is hard to meet strangers in the world that we're in right now, despite LinkedIn and all those advantages. Um, and you know, that, that I, it's one of the things that, again, as an old guy, I'm kind of excited about, um, is that an, uh, an asset I've always thought of as one of my core assets has multiplied in value. Um, and it does, I think it, it begs a logical question. And it, it looks like from the question board, you know, one of the ones up there is how does a young person break into BD in, in this world? Um, and I think it's a, it's a very challenging question. I would just add. Um, the question about how do you manage sourcing in the downturn, I think it gets into the prior question too a little bit. It's the culture of the firms that the private equity firms out there, you know, if they're, if they're slashing people or slashing budgets in a downturn when you've got to go find a high quality person, an high quality business to sell at the exactly wrong time to sell a business, you know, that can, that can scream a little bit to how they prioritize uh, sourcing within your organization, which obviously can impact comp, carry, bonus, you know, career pathing and everything else. But I think the best sourcing firms and the ones that I have the most respect for uh, almost double down in, in tougher times. Uh, back in 08, 09, uh, Glenn Skolnick, who was running the firm, came into my office and said, I'm going to go find deals. Go set me up on trips. Uh, all hands on deck, go help tenant sourcing, find deals so we could just get out and shake those trees. And, and I think firms that look at it differently, not that they won't be successful, um, that, it, that, that it can be harder. Uh, I sense too, on the downside, it depends, as I think all of us would say, there's more and more specialization among funds when we would all connect a long time ago as more generalist, more industry agnostic, uh, I still think the shoe leather that Gretchen referenced is, is uh, hard, but still the best way to create authentic relationships. But I do think the models have changed with regards to how sector focused sourcing, uh, and, and that could change how people will go about it in the next big downturn as well. It starts I, with firm strategy too, I think, because there are certain firms where they cannot handle complexity. They need perfection. And in the downturn, that's gonna be extraordinarily hard to find. If you happen to be a firm such as ours where we can handle complexity, then I think as the LP community finds and the data reflects, some of your near macroeconomic nadir or dislocated periods can be your most attractive periods in which to be investing. So we just, you know, full steam ahead, keep at it. Those differentiators being able to handle complexity uh, became become more relevant and more helpful. You know, success is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. When I think about Gretchen's comment about, I know everyone, that's one of the investment professionals in the firm, they don't need BD. And I go to Jay's comment, Jay said they did 100 add-ons. You don't find add-ons by dealing with a partner at Lazard or mm -hmm. Houlihan. You find those add-ons by finding and talking to the little investment banks that really, that, that one or two that, that Jay was talking about that are so important to them. And if you don't have those kinds constantly in the bed. CRM system isn't up to date. So when you do buy a company, your CRM system sends a blast out to everybody. I mean, I wasn't that successful at seeing everybody, but my CRM system was every time we bought a company. And Audax has been prolific on that. We have, uh, you know, we just have more people, but the more times you're buying a company and you're getting the news out, people want to come see you. And you've got to, you've got to talk to the smaller investment banks as well as the big ones. And if you don't have a BD function, your partners are only going to talk to the big guys that come in to see you, not you go out to see them. Guys, can we shift it over a little bit towards the, the future and kind of what BD 3.0 looks like? And, you know, it seems like you have mastered the skill set of the interpersonal, the one-to-one, -one, the one-to-few. How, how do you effectively leverage technology as an individual and within your BD team, maybe within the firm, 
to do the one to many tactics, the one to many strategies. You know, Jay, you know, all, all of you know so many people in this industry, but our brains can only handle so much and do it effectively. <laughs> So how do you use technology, maybe what specific systems do you use to build and nurture your network in a quality way? Yeah, I mean, the, I think you hit it. The, to me, it's the combination of, of sincere, best-in-class relationships with really good data. You know, I think if you go back to wave one, it was all about the relationships. And then we had a couple of waves where it was trying to be more and more about the technology and the CRM and people took that too far. You know, you would get the call. It was so clear, like, why are you calling me? Because Salesforce told me to call you 90 days from the last time I called you. You know, that's not a relationship. And the, the next generation is the combination of those two. The heuristics that you just referenced that we all have of customer concentration is bad. That may be true. It may also be that customer concentration is over penalized in the market because everybody deploys the heuristic of customer concentration is bad. And if you actually have the data on go buy companies with customer concentration, diversify that customer concentration throughout on acquisitions, we are in the seat to see that pattern. And I'm not advocating that pattern, but as an example, that, um, you, you, we could go through, everybody on this call could go through a list of things not to do in private equity. And now we have the opportunity to combine the data, the underlying data with that to see if it's true and find different ways to interpret that. You could say, you know, buy from investment banks. They, they show you 30 deals a year and they have a great process, but you pay a premium for that. Or people will say, buy from the most proprietary process that you can find. Those deals are cheap. Maybe they're cheap because that's the fair price. Um, the, the fusion of the relationship and the data is the future. And that will be run through this seat. Um, the deal professionals that are going to do two, three deals a year, um, a dozen deals in a career, don't have the view of all of the things going on. And, and this profession and this seat uh, is in a leadership opportunity if, if you take the time to embrace the data and the technology. Jay, that really makes me think about the next level deep that people need to go, which is, okay, here's your database, deal done, email 5,000 people. The next level of that is, no, I'm going to email the bankers this customized thing, the lawyers this customized thing, the lenders this customized thing. And that goes back to that data point and making it more custom because it all goes down to the relationship. We don't like generalized things. We like customized things. Um, it would be really cool if there was somebody who could help us do that on LinkedIn that knew how to do all yeah. that kind of stuff. You know anybody like that? I was just going to say, you know, email is definitely how we've all been doing it. And it's critical. It's Bob, you said it best. You know, I can't get to every, every bank or broker in North America, but my database can. Um, however, our database only has the people we know, which is great. And, you know, they're, we all have, databases with thousands of, of um, contacts in them. But what I think our industry has really embraced and seen mushroom in terms of interaction is LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the world of all the people we don't know. And if we can, you know, through how LinkedIn works, you know, we can deliver the same. I don't, I don't know what your guys' experience are. I'd be interested, but, you know, the responses you get back from an email versus the responses you get back from a LinkedIn post are just vastly different. You know, you get a lot on email, but nowadays I get a lot more on LinkedIn. I just think that's, um, I also think LinkedIn is a great space to, as a safe space for a business owner to reach out to very privately, no email trail, just to inquire, you know, what, what types of things are you interested in? How are you differentiated? I feel it like- It's basically become like a CRM. It's your tier one list because exactly. you see one post, two post, 10 posts. It's almost become a filter, uh, an added filter. Um, and it has a, a complete sense of, or a, a better sense of connectivity as opposed to you know, how many emails you get in a day. 100. Totally agree. Um, now there's a whole process to manage that. 
so that, you know, if you're partner level, for example, you're getting how many messages a day on LinkedIn. So how do you have your support team filter through that, for example, so you make sure you're getting important messages. Um, but it works. I mean, on our last webinar, Ted, you know, we were talking about the case study with Ryan Grant, who's a principal at HKW, he got 70,000 views on one post that led to 15 deal inbounds. That's the one to many stuff that works and is never going to be this good again on LinkedIn. It's just like Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Well, Brian, I, I don't know if Brian's listening, but his personality is just so dynamic. Of course he would get that many. <laughs> <laughs> for all the panelists, on average, for the last three years, what percentage of your deal flow is not sourced through an intermediary? Well, I can say um, in general, overall deal flow, um, it would be two thirds is not, and that's highly weighted to add-ons. So total deal flow add-ons and platforms, two thirds not from an intermediary. Platforms, two thirds from an intermediary. Rough, I'll second that. rough numbers. Kind of. Same for us. Um, well, that kind of goes into the question for a proprietary. How do you manage your activities during the day or the week so that you can focus on that either as an individual or with your team to get those um, maybe industry focused proprietary deals where you have to spend time with CEOs, the CFOs and teams? How do you think about managing your time for that? Maybe uh, go ahead. I need a quick no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's based on, on your experiences and what you feel is working. Um, frankly, the vast majority of, of our deals are coming through an intermediary. In the lower middle market, that intermediary may be an individual as opposed to a, a even mid-sized organization, but the vast majority are. And, and over the decades, um, you know, we've played with the ideas of doing uh, more proactive things. We have done some dedicated searches, but that still involves an intermediary. And uh, I, I would have respect and would love to, to hear from friends who truly have had a, a successful, truly proactive um, deal generation effort that does not involve an intermediary at all. For, for us, we really work closely with the intermediaries. Over this year for our microcap fund, I would say almost 50% of our deals are not through an intermediary. And that's because we've extended our expertise in BD and brought in the, the junior associates, investment professionals, and they start doing thesis driven searches on IT, on plumbing, on windows, fenestration. They, take, they pick a topic and they're responsible for sourcing 30 to 40 companies uh, a month that they have to call in. So they start scraping, they start using databases and the amount of activity that they're generating has been phenomenal. It's it's kind of like you know the old dial for dollars with Summit and and some of the others, um, but we're doing it especially on a, a particular theme, uh, and we have a director of research who creates thematic themes as well. So you start to doing that on focusing only on one thing. Pretty soon these young people get pretty good about asking the right questions, and if you're a PE firm talking to the CEO and you say I'm only looking at these, now they're interested because they want to know who else you're talking to. Um. Uh, do you think that that's a, a, a better tack for larger organizations? I mean, Riverside's quite a large organization and we're 15 people. So we've found it challenging to dedicate those resources to something which is prospective. I mean, it's, it sounds I like think it's, I think it's tough. It's very tough. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we ded dedicate it to the younger ones coming in, but we train them and they spend part of their time doing that. They're, they're writing up and they're doing the analytical work on real deals as well. But the amount of deals that we're closing this year in our microcap fund is astounding. Uh, right now, we have over 18 deals under LOI. Now, these are all small deals. Don't you know, don't get don't you know? Some could be a, a two million dollar equity check. Some could be a three million. Some could be eight or ten. But add-ons are our lifeblood. You know, people. You know, we've got 110 companies across our nine main portfolios. So add-ons are absolutely essential. Otherwise, we're just not going to make any money. Have you, are you making much hay with, with the program with new platforms as well as add-ons? Um, the new platforms, as soon as we get a new platform, we were going to announce one shortly. We've already got five or six people in that group starting to put a list together. And we're you, starting to use buy-side brokers like we've never used before on specific, on specific themes. Are, are you winning platforms through this approach? Not so much. I mean, be very, uh, not so much, no. 
That's um, right. Platforms in particular, anything over 5 million, 8 million of EBITDA, they're going to go to an investment bank. I mean, we're like every once in a while, we all get lucky. You know, you, there's no such thing. When they say there's no such thing as proprietary, I disagree. But, you know, they're far and few between. I mean, some people are much better at it than, than others. And in our large cap fund, well, for us, large cap, 10 to 40 million, maybe one a year. Uh, and that's an anomaly because it's a referral, but referrals are important. Uh, and that goes to the relationship that uh, Mark Jones was talking about, long-term relationships. That's that's where you get it. Yeah, you can't construct a whole portfolio uh, on uh, on proprietary deals. <laughs> no, <laughs> unless you, know, you we, want to buy one a year. We find that uh, from an add-on perspective, we've been having good success working with the CEOs and the partners before we close on creating a list. You know, at the end of the day, the leaders that we partner with should know, you know, they're right up the fairway ten plus add-ons and then we hire a firm to find the other characteristics of those companies. Uh, the buy side firms for platforms, you know, Bob nailed it, three or four million in EBITDA is about as large as you can get. And we look at it from a return on time. A lot of sourcing firms want volume, uh, cram that funnel at the top. Some don't, probably depends on what sectors you're chasing. But I think I think we would all agree our, our partners who, who look and pick at deals, they can be uh, less emotional if they have more things to pick through in your review. Hey, Jordan. Yeah. There's a good fundamental question that I wanted to highlight. Um, and I, I think it's important for this discussion. Uh, someone asked about how you track success in business development. And so knowing that it takes time to build success in deployment or what I would call achievement, you know, there's putting money to work, there's doing a deal, that's achievement. That's easy to measure, easy to pay for. How do you guys think about the other elements of the job that are important, I'll call it the activity per se, you know, like what activity is going to lead to deployment and how do you assess if people are on track? You can, uh, that's where I find, I think we would all agree. That's where we find some of the peers in our industry can get trapped by the culture the expectations that the firm that they're working for, you know, uh, the be snide is, you know, you get hired a P firm to go find deals Here's 800 relationships that are the firm's relationships that you're responsible for maintaining. And you got to go find three platforms a year that we're going to pay three X for from all these brand new relationships that you have to indeed go find. And by the way, you have no, you have no clout as to which deals you're bid on and or what value, you know, go have at it on your small budget. I mean, it's, it's not going to work. And I think, you know, um, you know, for those on the those that are still on on the on the Zoom here, if you're considering PE firms and doing sourcing, you know that that snide example is is loud and clear to all of us, and you need to be careful on on how you work through that. Gretchen, I see you nodding. You, what would you add? Hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, for for me, tracking the activity has always been about you know what is going to get us to the signed deal and the business owner that's going to say yes you know first of all you gotta gotta have deals coming in definitely that number shouldn't rise to infinity it should in fact go down at some point of your firm's evolution as you train the bankers what you want to see and not waste your time with the things you don't want to see so i think a, a good measurable is ios um, you know, those are deals that I and my team brought in that were attractive enough that the firm as a whole decided to issue an expression of interest, you know, spend some time, run a model, talk to executives, get some resources, apply it and do that. You know, so IOIs are, I think, a good indicator of things you're bringing in that are actionable deals for your firm. Um, now, what gets you to IOIs? That's tracking the boots on the ground. How many meetings, how many calls, how many, you know, panels where you demonstrate thought leadership, how many um, conferences you attend, those sorts of things are what drive the funnel and the relationship building drives the conversion to an IOI. And then driving conversion from IOI to LOI is a whole lot of very firm specific things that you bring. You know, I truly believe in a competitive process, the firm that logical firm that should buy that will win. Right, because they're bringing some angle, some executive, some experience to a process that resonates with the business owner. So we all have to find those deals 
that there's a Venn diagram that aligns with what is special about what we bring to it. And we, go, we should go hard at those deals, not every deal. I think that's a great point that I, like ILIs is a, is a wonderful metric. We've probably all been through this. Like early in your career, you start, you tried to score deals and score deal sources and you realize how different people see a deal or a deal source. And it's almost impossible to standardize that. But by it, by the firm, someone <laughs> saying, I will put my time on preparing this indication of interest and I will put a number to it, which means I had to do a model, which means I had to do a deck that like you can equate that with an amount of time. I think the best measure is, is man hours. You know, if you can get that, that is really hard to get accurately associated with a deal. And the great proxies of that are management meeting, IOI, LOI, ultimately closed deals. And I think it is smart to reverse engineer those steps and say, okay, a, 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 um, a management meeting is equivalent to a, a thousand hours of work across the firm. Uh, and, and to associate the points in your CRM with those. And then I think also it's really important to study the value of your deal sources. We all know deal sources that are good for 50 deals a year, none of which you even open the book. And there are other deal sources that will show you two deals and you will fight tooth and nail for both of them because you know the quality of that source. And if you can figure out how to lever that data and, and, and create a score system that is transferable to the rest of the firm, that's the, that's the sweet spot. Yeah, I think it's quantitative and qualitative. When we started out, we, we did how many deals have you brought? How many deals made it through the investment committee? How many pre IOIs calls did you make? How many IOIs? And then where the rubber hits the road, how many LOIs did you issue? And to go one step further, what we've started to do over the past couple of years is six months down the road, we go back and we, we, we start to track what they call deals done away. I got that from Jamie Dimon way back when at JP Morgan. What about the deals we didn't do or the deals we lost? Did you go back and look and see what happened to them? And every once in a while, when you have the time, you find that one nugget that it was a failed auction. They didn't call you up because you didn't make the cut. And then you call them up and say, gee, I should have thought of you. We've, that's happened a couple of times. So those are the processes that once you start to refine the basics of tracking what your BD person, then what else have you done? What about your database? And I would say one thing about management, it's up to management to figure out what are the right incentives? What should they be tracking? You know, the BD person might be floundering because they're bringing in so much because they tell you to bring it in because the investment professionals say bring it in. Somebody at the top has to say, enough of that. Let's not count numbers just so we can tell our LPs we're bringing in lots of deals. I want you to focus on specific industries. Uh, and that's sometimes the BD gets tied up in the woods because who pays his salary? The investment professionals. So you do what they tell you to do, but, they're, but they, may, they may be wrong and you've wasted it. So to go to the question, you know, who, who, who do you report to? You should never report to an investment professional. You should report to the head of the firm because they're the ones that are going to track it. And we have a, we used to call the pointy end of the spear. Our job is to fight the investment professionals if we think it's a good deal. And Jay, you, you hit it right on the nail. The numbers may not be there, but the quality of the, the investment banker that brings you these, when he puts his reputation on the line, say, I've met these people, you need to take a meeting. That every once in a while, you put your neck on the line for that when you go up against the investment professionals. And so if they're the ones that determine your salary, I think you have a failed, you have a failed uh, strategy. We used to say in the army when I spent there, expect what you inspect. And it's the guy at the top that has to inspect uh, and then he can expect performance. Sometimes, like I said, the BD guys get tie tied up in the trees because they're man the people that are doing the deals <laughs> are off on the wrong track. Well, this is great. Um, there are a lot of other questions and I think we'll just put together a summary article and probably either do some one-on-one -on -one calls or send some emails so we can get these answered. Cause I think, you know, this is a, a rare opportunity to bring together, you know, this panel and just hear all the knowledge that you have. And there's so much to learn here. I mean, uh, we'll probably have like a part two of this coming up. <laughs> yeah, we probably should, in my opinion, we probably should. I'd be more than happy to do it. I feel bad reading all these questions that we didn't yeah. scrape the surface. And, and I sense that a lot of people want to uh, have a genuine interest in, in, in being a professional in the sourcing and 
I think it's the least we can do for those on the on the Zoom call. Yeah. To help. Well, we agree. Agree. Especially that question that asks, what's the worst transaction you ever did or the worst relationship blow up you ever had? And I've got a couple of those. <laughs> I'm not putting mine on video though. <laughs> I just will, I'll, 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 I will put the names in to protect the innocent. No, you have to talk to legal. So guys, let's, uh, let's, let's end this by going around the table and leave with one specific piece of advice that you have for the BD professionals out there who are um, maybe just getting into it or mid-level. What is one piece of advice that you have for them so that they can have a successful career in BD? Gretchen? Be helpful to other people. Take the time. Endure the time suck. Uh, be helpful to other people, not just deal sources, everybody. Because as you build a 20-year pipeline, which is what we've all been doing for 20 years and more, that will come back to help you at some point and differentiate. Awesome. Bob, what about you? I'm going to dovetail onto what Jay said about moccasins. Put yourself in the other person's shoes and treat them as you want to be treated and it will resonate. That goodwill that you're generating, I'm not talking about Mary Poppins, I'm just talking about try to understand where they're coming from and address their concerns, not your concerns. Jay? Well, be long-term fair. Here we go. Mark? I think a good swing thought is to uh, realize that every interaction you have with an investment banker is potentially an, an audition or a non-audition for a future management meeting because in their eyes, you're sitting there across the table and you are the firm to them. So don't, don't screw it up. Awesome. Ted? Know your audience. Calling on some of the sophisticated bankers on, uh, on uh, listening to us is a lot different than small intermediaries and in smaller communities. Perfect. Glenn? Go wide in numbers, but then also go deep and on the going deep and, and the personal comments that folks have made, ask a magic question. What would you do for fun if you had more time? And people, people light up and the previous 15 minutes get forgotten and they'll remember you. Dan, taking us home. Yeah, no, I would say just it's been all said very well. Be human. Don't be binary to Bob's point. You know, know that there's it will come back to you. Um, work like hell and know that reputation and integrity wins long term. So just just own it. There we go. Thank you so much for doing this. Y'all have a great day. See Thanks you later. Bye, Thank you. Bye.